I'm going 16 kilometers per hour. If I start putting on the brake just as I pass this cactus... ...and mark the spot where my car comes to rest... ...I can then measure my stopping distance, which is 8 meters. I know that the car Holmes and Watson are driving is faster than mine and goes at 20 kilometers per hour, which means that their stopping distance will be a great deal longer. Hmm, let me see. Uh, distance varies directly as the square of the speed of the car. Hmm, 100 meters. <laughs> now I've got them! Distance to Dead Man's Gulch, 15 meters. Stopping distance of car, 100 meters. Result, goodbye, Holmes. Ha <laughs> ha, goodbye, Watson. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Oh, wonderful to be out in the wild, isn't it, Holmes? Oh, the wonders of nature. Hmm. But I say, what's that rattling noise? Could, could Moriarty have tampered with our engine? Oh, you worry too much, Watson. It's most unlikely the scoundrel would venture to a remote spot like this. Uh, turn left for Horseshoe Hotel, Holmes. Ah, splendid. I could do with a good wash and brush up. Oh, dusty work this, driving through the desert. Are you sure this is the right way to the hotel, Watson? Uh, of course. Can't go wrong if you follow the signs. Good Lord, that's Moriarty. Oh, I had a feeling there was foul play afoot. Dead Man's Gulch, 15 meters ahead, or we'll never be able to stop in time. No, oh, don't start that jumping business again, Watson. Moriarty has miscalculated as usual. At this speed, our stopping distance is not 100 meters, but precisely 12.5 meters. You see, nowhere near the cliff edge. My goodness, Holmes, how did you do it? I mean, you don't mean it's... Yes, Watson, it's time for Algebra again. Welcome to the Power of Algebra, Program 2. Once again, Sherlock Holmes has outwitted Moriarty thanks to his knowledge of algebra. In the last program, Holmes prevailed by knowing how to solve equations by using inverse operations, whether that be subtraction, addition, division, or multiplication. In this program, Sherlock Holmes wins by understanding something that we take for granted in our everyday lives. Doing things in the correct order, not getting the cart before the horse. Take this automobile assembly line, for instance. You can't just put a car together in any old sequence. You have to follow the rules, the order for the assembly of an automobile. Start with the chassis, attach the wheels, and install the engine. If you don't do things in the right order, you can get into a real mess. It's the same in algebra. You have to follow the rules. Take this equation. X equals 3 plus 4 times 2. It's ambiguous. Does it mean that x equals 3 plus 4, 7, times 2? That gives us 14. Or does it mean that x equals 3 plus 4 times 2, which is 3 plus 8, 11? To avoid this confusion, there are rules for the order of operations. The first of these rules is multiplication and division before addition and subtraction. For example, x times y before x plus y. So that when you're faced with this sort of equation in algebra, you can be quite sure that you have to do the multiplication part first. Or if you have x equals 3 plus 4 divided by 2, you know that you have to do the division first. 4 divided by 2 is 2, which leaves you with x equals 3 plus 2. That's all very straightforward, but suppose for some reason you wanted to change the order of operations. Suppose you needed to install the engine before you attach the wheel. You might want to set off or group the engine installation process to indicate that it has to be done before attaching the wheels. It's the same in algebra, where the grouping is done by means of grouping symbols, like 
parentheses, or brackets. For example, in that first equation, if for some reason we wanted the addition to be done before the multiplication, we put parentheses around 3 plus 4. This is the second rule of the order of operations. Do the operations inside grouping symbols first. For example, x plus y in parentheses before x times y without parentheses. The uh, Shreveport Assembly Plant is a division of General Motors a Truck and Bus Group. And here at the plant, we assemble uh, light duty pickup trucks in three styles. I have found that uh, mathematics was an essential part of my education for the type of job that I have to do here. A large portion of the engineers are degreed. All of them have a heavy math background regardless of what their particular job is. On a day-to-day -day basis, we must make decisions, uh, think through problems using uh, very systematic methods. Um, statistical process control is uh, one area we're very heavy into in this plant, and all of these type of things uh, require a good math background. The field that I'm in, in, in engineering and, and maintenance, uh, definitely requires uh, a large background in mathematics. Uh, but that's not the only, uh, the only field in this plant that requires that. The material department, the scheduling department uh, also need a, a good base in mathematics. Just take the uh, scheduling, for example. We have uh, chassis being built up in one part of the plant. We have bodies being built up in the other part of the plant. They must come together at the right point. If they don't, we've got a real problem. We've got a blazer sitting on a pickup truck chassis or the other way around. Uh, and all through the plant, uh, scheduling is extremely important. Things have to be calculated. They have to be figured right to the nose so that the right part hits the right truck every time. If that doesn't happen, uh, you could imagine the consequences. It's disastrous. Algebra was fun for me, but uh, I guess uh, I, I really liked mathematics and uh, all through grade school and high school, and I'm sure uh, that's one of the reasons that I uh, picked uh, engineering for a field because math kind of leads you into that even though it can help you in a lot of fields. Um, probably the, the best way to, uh, to learn ma mathematics, algebra in particular, I would think is to try to relate it to real life problems. Uh, rather than just looking at uh, letters and numbers and formulas, uh, if you can look at it as, as trying to solve uh, real problems, whether either at, at home or in your hobbies or uh, if you've had any work experience in your work, try to relate it to, to a real type problem. Uh, to me, that would make it the most, most fun and I guess you'll actually see what it can do for you. There are all sorts of operations involved in the manufacture of an automobile. Lots of technical terms too. Carburetor, gasket, camshaft, and so forth. In the same way, there are technical terms involved in algebra. For example, when two or more numbers are multiplied, they're called factors. But when a number is multiplied by itself, it can be written like this, 4 squared, or 4 to the power of 2. Then the number 4 is called the base, and the small number 2, the exponent. To describe what's going on here, we say that the base 4 is to be used as a factor two times. When the exponent's 3, as in 4 cubed, or 4 to the power of 3, we say that the base 4 is to be used as a factor three times, and so on, with 4 to the power of 4, 4 to the power of 5, 4 to the power of 6, and so on. Now, the key to all this is the little raised number, the exponent. This may be small, but it's literally very powerful. For example, 4 to the power of 6 might not look much different from 4 times 6, but it's not the same thing at all. 4 times 6 is only 24, whereas 4 to the power of 6 means 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, which is 4,096. Because exponents are so powerful, there's another rule of the order of operations. Do the operations with exponents before anything else. For example, x squared before x plus y in parentheses. So if you're faced with something like this, first you do the exponential operation, 3 squared, which is 9, Second, the operation inside the grouping symbols, 5 plus 3, which is 8. And third, the multiplication, 4 times 5, 20. 
Finally, you do the addition, 9 plus 8 plus 20, which equals 37. Now, can you guess what went wrong with Moriarty's scheme to send Holmes and Watson over the cliff? You and your algebra, Holmes. How could you be so sure that Moriarty had miscalculated our stopping distance? Because he's always putting the cart before the horse. I, I, I don't follow you, Holmes. How do we work out the stopping distance of a car? Oh, oh I know that one. The uh, stopping distance of a car varies directly with the square of the speed of the car. That is, distance equals speed squared uh, multiplied by a constant of variation. The constant of variation is always the same, so the constant of variation can be written as k equals d over s squared. Righto. So let's call Moriarty's stopping distance d sub 1 and his speed s sub 1 squared. Uh, but the same thing also applies to our stopping distance and speed. Of course, Watson. Let's call that d sub 2 over s sub 2 squared, which gives us the equation d sub 1 over s sub 1 squared, d sub 2 over s sub 2 squared. Now then, I happen to know the speed at which Moriarty drives his car. 16 kilometers per hour, and he once boasted that he could stop in 8 meters at that speed. Oh, I see. So we can substitute 8 for D sub 1 and 16 for S sub 1. And we can put in our speed as well, which is much faster than Moriarty's 20 kilometers per hour. So the only unknown variable is our stopping distance, D sub 2. Quite so, and that's easy to work out. First, we get D sub 2 on its own by carrying out the inverse operation of division, which is multiplication. We multiply both sides by 20 squared. Which gives us D sub 2 equals 8 divided by 16 squared multiplied by 20 squared. Now then, following the correct order of operations, we do the exponential operation. 20 squared, which is 400, then 16 squared, which is 256. Then we multiply 8 by 400 and get 3200 and divide that by 256, which gives us 12.5. So then our car has a stopping distance of 12.5 meters. But that's exactly what you said, Holmes. You were right. Am I ever wrong? I don't know, but what did Moriarty do wrong? I told you, Watson, he put the cart before the horse. Instead of doing the exponential operations first, he must have started by multiplying 8 by 20 to get 160, and then squared that to get 25,600, and then divided that by 16 squared, which is 256. Uh, 25,600 divided by 256 equals 100. Oh, so that's why Moriarty thought our stopping distance would be 100 meters. Of course, I knew it all along, but he didn't know his order of operations. Well, oh, you never cease to astound me, Holmes. I know. Moriarty really has no chance against my giant intellect, huh? Uh, there's that rattling noise again. A mind like a steel trap. No, Holmes, I'm serious. Uh, something is rattling. That scoundrel must have got at the engine. Watson, you're the only one who's rattled. Holmes, look! Oh, my goodness! 